My name is Ivan Hu, and today we will be learning about the basics of data visualization using R. First, before we start, a bit of background about myself. I am from Hong Kong, and I'm currently studying a Bachelor of Science at the University of Sydney with a double major in mathematics and statistics. Before we leap into the material, I'll provide a brief overview of what we will be covering this lesson. As you can see on this slide, there are four sections to this material. First, I will provide a quick introduction to R, uh, focusing on the core essentials, such as some basic calculations and creating variables, as well as looking at some objects. Next, we will be able to develop some basic plotting skills in R. To achieve this, we will install the tidyverse package. This package contains a very powerful function called ggplot, as well as some very useful data sets. We will begin by using ggplot to make some basic graphs. After that, we will be examining two commonly used plotting methods, namely lines of best fit and bar plots. For both of these methods, we will focus on getting R to produce our desired graphs, and interpreting the results in graphs. There are a few exercises scattered throughout this presentation. When we do reach them, it will be very helpful to pause and try to work them out on your own before resuming to see the solution. It's also highly recommended to pause after each slide and attempt to at least replicate what is shown on screen. If you do have time to experiment with the material presented, that will produce the best results. Now, without further ado, let us begin with the basics of R. We will look at how to install R, some basic commands, learn how to manipulate various objects, such as numbers and strings, as well as some sequences. And then we will learn about storing data and data frames and using variables. We will also be looking at one particular function, the help function. So throughout this presentation, we will be using RStudio to run R. If you don't already have RStudio installed, don't worry. It is not hard to install and completely free to use. First, go to the link shown on this slide here and then scroll down to find the appropriate installer for whatever operating system you are using. For example, if you're using Windows, then use the Windows installer. And if you're using a Mac, then use the Mac OS installer. Once you have the installer uh, installed on your, well, whatever device you're using, run it and follow the directions and you should be done. Note that the free version is already extremely powerful in its own right and more than sufficient for most data analysis. So once you have RStudio installed, the first thing you should do is run it. Starting RStudio should be the same process as starting any other program on your device. Once you have RStudio up and running, you should see something similar to what is shown on this slide, if not exactly the same. Note that the screen is effectively separated into three different uh, places. On the left is your R console. R console. This is where we will be executing all of our R commands. There is a big blob of text in the console upon each time you load it. You can safely ignore this text. On the upper right, we have the environment. This stores all the variables you will create among other items. You can basically think of it as a giant storage closet where we can put things in and take them out later on for use. On the bottom right, we have a big blank space. You can think of this as the plotting or documentation window for the time being, i.e. the place where plots, like bar charts or graphs will pop up as well as documentation for various functions or data sets. 
there are more things that can pop up there, but we will not have to worry about them until later. Now, our first job here is very simple. We want to get rid of the giant block of text to make our console look much neater. There are two ways of achieving this. One way is to hit the small button on the upper right at the top right of the corner. After you press it, the console should become a nice clean piece of white space, as you can see on this particular slide here. The other way is a keyboard shortcut, namely pressing Control L on the keyboard. This probably only works for Windows, since that's the system I myself am familiar with. Feel free to search online for a keyboard shortcut for clearing the console on whichever operating system you yourself are using. The, at the end of the day, though, both ways work perfectly fine, and it is ultimately entirely up to preference which method is best for you. Because the main thing really is to just clear the console in some way when you need to. So now we will put our very nice and clean console to some actual use. First, we will look at one of the most basic uses for R, namely that of a very, very big and very powerful calculator. As you can hopefully see on this slide over here, R works very well as a large calculator and is very much capable of performing these sorts of calculations with incredible ease. Note the use of the asterisk or the symbol that looks like a little star for multiplication, as well as the use of the common slash for division. It's very important to keep these two symbols in mind when performing calculations like this in R. Of course, R is capable of much, much more as we will soon see. But for now, let's just focus on this. So to actually run your code, you will generally want to type your command into the console and then press the enter button. For example, type in three plus five and then hit the enter button. You should then see the results, eight printed out. In general, this is how commands are run. You type what you want R to do and hit enter. If your command makes sense, then R will hopefully do what you want it to. And if it doesn't make sense, then R will most likely throw up an error message of sorts. As I have stated before, I highly recommend that you work along in R alongside this video by both first replicating what is on screen and to also experiment further. After all, learning by doing invariably gives much better results than just learning by listening. Throughout the video, I will give some suggestions for you to tinker with. You can use these suggestions I give as a starting point, but feel free to go further if you want. To start off, I recommend you try to make some more random calculations with R just to get used how, to how commands are often run. So if you do end up choosing to work in R alongside this video, then in general, I suggest you clear the console before moving on to the next slide, unless I tell you otherwise myself. There are a few slides where you probably should not clear the console before moving on. Do not worry, in those cases, I will explicitly tell you not to clear the console. So now let us move on to some basic objects in R. You can think of objects in a uh, general informal sense as things that can be categorized in different ways. We will start with two objects 
called strings and numbers. Both of these objects will be used a lot in R. So the first object we will focus on are strings. Now, string objects can be thought of as a bunch of words and treated in a similar fashion. Strings are always enclosed in quotation marks, as you can hopefully see from the first and third commands on this slide. These quotation marks are very important. To make a string, you have to start and end with a quotation mark. If you do forget the quotation marks, R will not be happy and behave oddly, potentially drawing up some error messages or Actually, in this case, R won't draw up some error messages. So try making some strings of your own. And you could even try you know, forgetting a quotation mark at the end to see what happens. So a general note is to note that if R does behave weirdly, you can always just hit the escape button and that should hopefully stop the weirdness. Worst case scenario, you can always just restart R. So now we can move on to number objects. And these are, well, numbers, as that's the reason they're called that. As we've seen, we can perform some basic calculations with them, such as adding or multiplying them. Note that you can place a number or even a calculation inside a string, as you can see on the third command. But these numbers and calculations will behave differently compared to the case where you are not putting them inside a string, i.e. when you're basically just using them as a command. Indeed, note that 5,000 plus 3,000 in this case is not evaluated, but is instead left as it is as a sum. For now, don't worry about the text on the bottom right corner of this screen. We'll come back to what that sort of thing really means later. So let us now move on to vector objects in R. If you have studied some mathematics before, you may have been exposed to vectors. Uh, if you haven't, that's also perfectly fine. You can just think of them as an ordered list of numbers in a very informal sense. I'm sure that some people will not be happy with my description of that, but for now, just think of them like that as an ordered list of numbers. So to create a vector, we start with the letter C and a set of parentheses. Once we have that, we merely need to place the object that we want inside the vector with each object separated by commas. As you can see on this slide, those objects do not need to be numbers, unlike in mathematics. They can be strings or a combination of numbers and strings. Experiment further with these sort of vectors. See if you can create more of them. Now, we can move on to operations that can be done with vectors. First, Note that we can add two vectors together to output a third vector, which is very similar to adding two numbers. In this first particular case, each component of each vector is added to the component of the other vector. For example, in the first row, note that each one is added to the two to output a three in the final vector that is uh, to be basically put out onto the screen by R. This is also known as termwise addition, since we are basically adding term by term. We can also multiply a vector by a constant. This in effect effectively means we are scaling each component by a number. For example, note that we are multiplying each term by 10 in the third row. More generally, we can multiply each vector component wise. For example, when multiplying the vector 2, 2, 3 
with one, two, three, we obtain two, four, nine, where the output comes from multiplying each component of the first two vectors. Indeed, note that two is just two times one, four is two times two, and nine is three times three. Similarly, we can divide each vector by a constant or do termwise division of vectors. So if you have learned about vectors in mathematics before, this just means like it should just be taken into consideration that vectors in R may behave a little bit differently compared to vectors that you are used to as well as basic vector operations like multiplication and division in a sense. So now I suggest you see what else you can or even cannot do with vectors. Can you add a vector of strings in R, for example? Or is R not happy with that? What other things can you do or can you not do? Perhaps try adding two vectors with a different number of components. Is this possible? What does R give you in this situation? Also, what about other operations, like say multiplying two vectors or dividing two vectors with a different number of components? Feel free to experiment as much as possible and go further with your experimentation than what I have suggested. And always remember, if R does end up behaving oddly and you cannot interact with R, you can first hit the escape button which should terminate the current process and hopefully resolve whatever issues you have. And even and if you hit escape and R is still being wonky, then just try to close R and restart it. Now we can look at more operations with vectors. For example, we can square a vector which results in squaring each component of the vector. In a similar fashion, we can take the square root or logarithm or even the exponential of a vector. Note that in each of these cases, we are effectively applying the function to each individual component, as you can see for all of these cases on this slide. Now you might think that all functions behave like this with respect to vectors, this is not always the case. Indeed, we can, so this part, I suggest that you create a vector of your own and try applying the sum function to it. So type sum into the console, then put parentheses at the end of the word sum. Now I'll put a vector inside the parentheses. The result should be a single number that is the sum of all the components of the vector, which makes sense since this is exactly what we would expect some sort of like summation function to end up doing. So in essence, the output of a function applied to a vector may not always be a vector. For further experimentation, I suggest you perhaps try applying functions of functions to these sorts of vectors, perhaps, or try doing some basic vector operations with the exponential or the logarithm of two vectors, so let's say. In any case, feel free to explore as much as you want. So now we turn to look at sequences. They are exactly what they sound like. Namely, a sequence of numbers created according to some basic rule. A very basic and quick way to create a sequence is by giving our starting number, then a colon, 
than an ending number. This gives us a sequence of numbers that go up by one. This suffices for a basic sequence, such as one going from one to 10, by only increasing by one. But sometimes we want a little bit more control over the separation between numbers in a sequence. To do that, we will use the seq or seq function which is short for a sequence and allows us to create basic arithmetic sequences. In this function, there are three arguments of interest, namely the number that a sequence will start from, which we will also call the starting number, and the number that the sequence will end at, we will call the ending number, and finally, how much the sequence should increase by. For example, if we want a sequence from 0 to 10 again, but increasing by 0 0.1 for each increment, then we will need to type out what's in the second command on this screen, namely seq followed by brackets, and with the brackets enclosed, we write from equals 0, the starting number, then 2 equals 10, the ending number, and we want to increase it by equal 0 0.1. We can also make a sequence from 0 to 20, increasing by 4 each time, as we can see from the third command. Hopefully you can understand what's going on in these commands now. Note that all our examples have an integer as a starting and ending number, and that both the starting and the ending numbers appear in the sequence. So what happens if we don't use integers? Does the ending, for example, let's say we start from the square root of two, what happens then? Also, does the ending number necessarily have to be in the sequence always? Try creating a sequence such that the ending number does not appear in the sequence. And finally, note that in all of our sequences, the numbers are increasing. Can you think of a way to perhaps create a decreasing sequence? As a final note, both of these sequences are limited to arithmetic sequences, i.e. sequences that increase that are increasing by a common value that is added to the next term, so to the previous term in essence, i.e. we have a starting number and then we add a constant number, say 0 0.1 to it, and we continue on, so on and so forth. So as a final rather challenging extension, try to construct a geometric sequence using only the sequence function. This is pretty optional. And don't worry if you can't, it's pretty hard to think of a way to do so. So we have done a lot of work involving various objects. It can certainly be a major hassle to try and keep the values of all of these objects in your mind, especially for very large objects which store a lot of data. Indeed, you will be commonly working with objects that may very well store hundreds, thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of data points. And obviously that's completely impossible to keep track of on your own. Fortunately, R can easily handle all of that storage for you with the use of variables. In essence, and in a very informal way, variables can be thought of as a way to store data in R. As you can see, we can store different types of data in a variable, whether it be a number, a vector, a sequence, or a string. The variable names themselves must not contain spaces. Here, we have labeled our variables with x, followed by a number. 
this choice of name was entirely arbitrary. We could have called them, say, variable one, variable two, etc., or even, you know, dingy one, dingy two, etc. It doesn't really matter. We will soon see other examples of variable names too, indeed, throughout this presentation. Note that the variables themselves will be stored in the environment, as was hinted at previously. So to clear your variables in the environment, you can hit the small button that the green arrow is pointing to. To my knowledge, there isn't a keyboard shortcut for this, unfortunately. There are many different standards of naming variables, such as camel case or snake case. You can search online for different types of variable naming conventions and pick one that you like the most. Regardless of whichever method you end up choosing, uh, just remember to be consistent. That is always the most important thing. Data frames, then, are the final objects that we will be discussing. These can be thought of as a way to store a bunch of vectors, much like how vectors can be thought of as a way to store a bunch of numbers or strings. As can be seen here, we have created three vectors, vector 1, vector 2, and vector 3. And we have stored them in those variables that have just been named. As can also be seen here, the values in the vectors can be numbers or strings. Both work perfectly fine when creating a data frame out of vectors. So right now we have these three vectors. Uh, let's say then that we want to store them in a more compact form. To do that, we should indeed store them in a data frame, which will be very helpful and indeed actually quite necessary when plotting graphs using the ggplot function later. So to create a data frame, we will use the data.frame function. This effectively places the data into a matrix of sorts where the values in each individual column match the corresponding vector. For example, the second column in the data frame stored in the df variable matches the values in vector two, its corresponding column. Also, note that the order of the vectors are very important in determining where each column is in the data frame. If we had put a vector two first, followed by vector one and then vector three, the columns of the data frame would change. Let's try it out, see what happens when we do end up swapping the order of the vectors. Note that in our example, all vectors have the same length. Is this necessary? i.e. can we make a data frame out of vectors of different lengths. Try this out too and see what happens then. So before we do continue, here is a very useful function that you will most likely use a lot later on. This function is called the help function and it gives you information on a particular object whether that object is a data set or a function. For example, let's say you want to know more about the sequence function, SEQ. We can either place the SEQ function inside the help function, as you can see in the first line, we'll type a question mark followed immediately by the SEQ function, as can be seen in the second line on the screen. Both will give the same results, and whichever one you do end up using is entirely up to preference. 
The bottom right screen now shows details help for the SEQ function. So as a result, if you ever feel that my explanations are insufficient or just want to know a little bit more about a particular function or data set beyond what I'm describing, then feel free to use the help function. We have thus far covered some of the key basics of R. Before we move on to basic plotting, I'll do a quick recap of what we have covered to refresh your memory. The core idea of these past few slides revolves around storing and manipulating data. So to achieve this, we have examined the different types of objects in R, namely numbers, strings, and vectors. Numbers are just uh, numbers you're familiar with. Strings, in essence, can be thought of as words for all intents and purposes for the time being. Vectors are informally an ordered list of objects, whether the objects be numbers, strings, or a mixture of both. We also looked at some sequences, which can basically be thought of as a vector of numbers that follow an arithmetic sequence, i.e. a vector where the next term comes from the previous term plus a constant number. We also looked at performing some basic operations with these objects, in particular with numbers and vectors. The operations with numbers follows most of what you are familiar with for these numbers, such as adding and subtracting them. If the vector consists only of numbers, then you can do vector operations on them too such as adding or multiplying two vectors term by term. In a similar vein, you can even do that for sequences, since those are basically vectors of numbers. We also looked at how to store data using R with variables. We can, for example, store a number or a vector in a variable which allows R to remember the values for us, which is very convenient. Additionally, we can store vectors in a data frame, which can be thought of as a large matrix of sorts, if you are familiar with matrices. If not, then just think of them as a very nice and compact way to store a big list of vectors. Finally, we took a brief detour to look at the help function, which is something you can always consult when you're feeling kind of stuck. So feel free to rewind the video, video back to earlier sections if you find yourself forgetting something. So now, without further ado, let us examine some basic plotting methods in R. There are many ways of creating plots in R. For example, base R has a simple plot function that can work to create a quick, simple plot. While those plots are often perfectly fine to work with, they are quite limited in how they can present the data. Instead, we will be using the ggplot function for the most part which grants us significantly more control over the final presentation of data, as well as the various aesthetic elements of, very, of these sorts of plots. So to obtain this function, we will first need to install the tidyverse package. I will go over how this package can be obtained and introduce some basic plots with the ggplot function. So to install the tidyverse, all you need to do is to just type exactly what is in the first line, install.packages, and then brackets, and then 
the tidyverse made as a string. So once you do run that command, you will uh, end up like seeing a big deluge of the various messages. They may look very scary, but I, I can tell you this, do not worry about them. Just wait until R is finished with installing the tidyverse, which may take quite a while since there's a lot of stuff inside the tidyverse and you will be all right in the end. So in terms of what the tidyverse is, it can be thought of as a very big collection of code in various forms, such as functions and data frames. And it is all of these have been developed by a very large group of people. It is basically a collaborative effort and has been very fruitful indeed. So as noted previously, we will mainly be using a ggplot function from the tidyverse and focusing on the various things you can do with the ggplot function in particular. So once you have finished installing the tidyverse, you won't need to install it again if you are to use it again in the future. You will, however, need to load the tidyverse at the start of each R session in the future. And this includes your current session, if you are working alongside this video in R. So to load it, just type the first line, library brackets tidyverse, this time not as a string, just as the word tidyverse. And then hit enter again to run that command. So the tidyverse will then be loaded and you can now access all of the code from the package. Again, there will be a like big bunch of messages that pop up on the screen as, and that might be similar to some of the things you see here. Uh, and again, just ignore those messages too and clear the console again once you are finished. Like loading the tidyverse. Now we can finally get started on actually using the ggplot function. We will first uh, conduct some basic plots, such as crossing the line, y is equal to 100x in the bottom right section. As noted previously, this can be thought of as the plotting window as one of its main functions. So to do this, we will need to create a vector of x and y values and store them in a data frame. For our x values, we will go from 0 to 10 with an increment of 0 0.1 and store them in the variable x. The y values then will simply be the function 100 times x applied to the vector x. And these y values will be stored in the aptly named the variable y. So to plot something with ggplot, we have to store our data in a data frame. So recall from the previous section that we can create the required data frame by using the data.frame function. Put the vectors x and y in that order into the data.frame function and store the resulting data frame in the variable df. So we now have our data in an appropriate format for ggplot to make the plot that we want. So to reiterate, it is incredibly important that you put your data in a data frame for ggplot to be able to actually plot things. Simply leaving your data in vector form does not suffice for the most part. So if you do feel a bit uncomfortable with sequences, operations with vectors, or creating data frames out of vectors, 
feel free to pause the video here and then rewind back to previous sections for a quick review. So if you are working alongside this video, I do recommend that you do not clear the console for now and certainly do not clear the environment either. We will be continuing with this code in the next section, especially the variables in the environment. That is very important to keep for the next slide. So we now can use the ggplot function. The function takes in the data stored in the data frame df, as well as some aesthetic elements, i.e. coordinates, enclosed in the AES function. Since we want a plot of x and y variables, we tell ggplot that our aesthetics involve the x equal x and y equal y columns in the data frame df. Once we have told ggplot that information, we then tell ggplot that we want to create a line graph by adding the geom underscore line function to the ggplot function. As you can see in the third, I mean, in the fourth uh, line. In essence, think of the main ggplot section as the data and core aesthetic elements and everything else added to it as supplementary information that further import, informs ggplot what and how we want to plot something. It should be noted that this is not the only way to use the ggplot function and others may have different formats that end up performing the same thing, which they prefer, which you may see as you continue studying statistics and data science. This format here then, in a way, is just what I personally prefer to use. The main thing as usual is to be consistent in your code. For the time being, I do recommend that you follow my style solely for the reason that it will help you follow along with this presentation. So now, if you are upward, try experimenting with the x variable. What happens if we change the increments? For example, try an increment of by equal 0 0.01 and then by equal 1. Does this change anything in a plot if it changes anything at all? Also, what happens if we change the starting and ending numbers? What happens to the plot in that situation? If you really want to extend yourself, you could try different functions of y, which in fact leads on to what we will be doing on in the next slides. So we now have the first exercise of our video. I will provide you with the solution in the next slides. So as you can hopefully see from the screen on here, our goal is to plot the function y is equal to the log of x squared using ggplot with the requisite notes listed out as on this screen. For example, we should start from x equals 0 0.01 and end at x equals 10 with increments of 0 0.01. So this is fairly similar to what we have covered in the previous two slides, except with the function changed. So feel free to rewind back to those slides to refresh your memory if you need to. I now suggest you pause on this screen, redo the instructions carefully, and go into R to try out the exercise. So if you have gone to R to try out the exercise and have come back, then let us proceed to the solution without further ado.
So hopefully you managed to obtain something similar to our plot here. So obviously we first need to make the requisite sequence of X values with the increment of 0 0.01 that was asked for. We then create the required sequence of Y values by simply using the log function to take the log of X squared. Once we have both of those values, we can then create our desired data frame by using the data.frame function and placing X and Y into them in that particular order. So now we are ready to plot using ggplot. We tell ggplot that our data is stored in the data frame df. The aesthetic values or coordinates we care about in df are then the x and y values. And those are to be mapped onto the x and y axes respectively, which is done because we have told uh, or that the x value is equal to well, x in this case and the uh, y coordinates are thereby just the y values themselves. We finally tell R to plot a line graph by adding the geom underscore line function to ggplot, to the ggplot function that we have made. Try experimenting with this example too. What happens this time when we change the increment for x to y equals one? Does the graph still look the same or have things ended up changing? If they have ended up changing, can you think on why? It should be noted that line plots simply join a straight line between successive data points. As a quick aside, before we move on, I do recommend you to call for more help for the ggplot function here and try going through some of the documentation if you haven't already done so yourself. All this documentation may seem very intimidating for now, but if you can de develop a decent understanding of at least some of the material, that's most listed out in the documentation, it will certainly pay off very well very later. And if you cannot recall what the help function does, feel free to rewind the video to that particular point in time. I also recommend that you keep going back to call for more help about ggplot the more we learn, so you can also further understand what is going on with the help function here. And in terms of the documentation for ggplot here. So before we move on to the next section, let us do a quick recap of using ggplot to do basic plots in R. So first we installed the tidyverse package, and then we loaded it up. Note that every time you start R and want to use the tidyverse package, namely the functions and data sets that it contains, you'll need to load it again with the library function. So for future reference, this works for any package. We then learned how to use ggplot to make basic 2D plots, namely by creating vectors of X and Y values, storing them in a data frame, and placing them into ggplot with the geom underscore line function. And then finally, we learned that there are some core elements of the ggplot function that are needed for any sort of plot, namely a data frame of data as well as aesthetic values, which basically specify the coordinates of interest. So now that we have established some of the core essentials for plotting with ggplots, 
we can thereby move on to plotting with real data, which is exactly what we will be doing in the next section. We can now learn how to make plots with real data now using ggplot, which ties more closely in with actual applications of ggplot. As you will shortly see, these sorts of plots with involving real data generally won't look anywhere near as nice as the basic plots of the various functions that we will have looked at previously. Another way of saying this is that real data tends to be very noisy in a sense. The data sets we will use for this section also come from the tidyverse package and these data sets themselves are already stored in data frames ready for us to use immediately which is very convenient for our purposes indeed do remember that data frames are needed for ggplot so without further ado let us begin so for our real life data we will be using the MPG dataset. This dataset gives fuel economy data about popular models of cars from a set time period. Data such as the manufacturer of a car, as well as the car model, among other data, are provided in this dataset. So to gain a quick glimpse of the data, we can use the glimpse function from the tidyverse, which does exactly what it says it does. The peak that it gives is slightly more detailed and compact compared to just typing in MPG, as you can hopefully see from the comparison on this slide over here. So note that the data is organized by columns with the glimpse function as opposed to rows in the one you simply just type it in, and also gives the type of data in each column, such as CHR for character or string and INT for integer. This uh, organization by columns is particularly useful if the data set contains many columns, let's say 50 or so, since in that case, like arranging by columns would be much more helpful in that situation. So we can now also call for more help about the MPG data set using the help function, which will give us a lot more information about the various columns that are contained and what they actually mean. Indeed, as you can hopefully see in the bottom right corner, details about this data set are thus displayed. I suggest you pause the video here and now and take a closer look at what each data at what each column describes. It is very important that you understand exactly what we are plotting so as to properly interpret future graphs. We now want to use ggplot to plot engine size against fuel efficiency to see if there does exist a possible relationship between these two particular variables, i.e. how does engine size affect fuel efficiency if there is actually such an effect in the first place. First, we need to look at the two variables we are examining in the MPG data set. So if you did go through the detailed help for the MPG data set, as was suggested in the previous slide, you should recognize that the DISPL or display column is the engine displacement in liters, which is also a way of measuring engine size while the HWY column shows the highway miles per gallon, which is a way of measuring fuel efficiency 
note that high values of display or DISPL mean and larger engine size, while high values of HWI means high fuel efficiency. So now to actually make a plot with ggplot, we need to feed ggplot the data frame, which in this case is simply just MPG, as well as the aesthetic values or what to plot under coordinate axes. We want the DISPL variable on the x-axis, since this serves as our independent variable, and the HWY variable on the y-axis, which will then serve as our dependent variable. So this time, we add geom point function to tell ggplot to make a scatter plot. Note that we are placing the ggplot graph inside a variable this time. As you can see on this screen, this is perfectly fine and in fact will be very convenient when dealing with multiple graphs, as we will see later. So to reiterate, it is 100% okay to pl place a ggplot graph and store it inside a variable. So for this slide, I suggest you do not clear the console and certainly do not clear the environment. We'll be using these self-same variables for the next slides. Now, let's say we also want to figure out how does the type of car influence engine size and fuel efficiency while still keeping a two-dimensional plot. In the MPG datasets, the type of car is represented by the variable class. So to achieve our goal, we can add on an extra color axis in a sense, where each point in the scatter plot will have a color that depends on the car type. To achieve this, we can do what is shown here for the plots that is stored in the variable G2, where we add on the color axis in the aesthetic section for ggplot, which is dependent on the variable class. The new plot we obtain then contains information for the variables HWY, DISPL, and class all stored in a two-dimensional plot. Note that there is now a legend on the right side of the graph when plotted, which shows what color corresponds to each car type. Indeed, check the graph in the bottom right corner. I suggest you contrast this plot to the plot we did in the previous slide, which was stored in variable G and which you hopefully still have. So to reiterate, the only difference we actually made was to effectively add on an extra color axis of sorts, where each point in the scatter plot is now considered as per the car type according, which is colored according to the legend. In a sense, this allows us to basically plot three variables inside uh, two-dimensional plots, which ends up resulting in a very compact way of storing extra information without necessarily adding a new dimension, which is actually very convenient for visualization. So before we do move on to the next slide, it's okay to clear the console, but do not clear the environment because again, we will still be using some of these variables in the next slides. So now we want to label the axes and main title so people just reading the graph can actually understand what is being plotted. This is a very important step and I highly suggest that you learn to master this very well. So first, note that we can effectively add changes to a graph, such as the one that has been stored in the variable G2, 
So this ends up being a very convenient way of adding changes to a graph that has already been stored in the variable and can help you split up changes to a plot to make it clear exactly what you're doing at each particular step when adding something new to the uh, plot. So now we can take the graph stored in the variable G2 and add to it some labs, which is short for labels. So in the labs function, we can provide a label for the X and Y variables, uh, in which in this case, we should label them engine size measured in liters and highway miles per gallon, respectively. We should also add on a nice title for the graph too that summarizes what is going on. In this case, we say car type and engine size on fuel efficiency. So once we have finished that, we will take the graph that is stored in the variable G2, add to it some labs or which is sort for labels and store the sum of these changes in the new variable G3. We can then plot the new graph G3. So note the changes in axis and main titles in this new graph as shown on the bottom right of this slide here. Again, feel free to clear the console before moving on to the next slide now. But again, please do not clear the environment as we will still be using these self-same variables again. A final uh, thing to note with respect to how the plot may look is to note that we can change the theme of the plots. So there exists a lot of different themes that are available for ggplot. To use a theme, simply take the g3 variable, which we have created in the previous slide, and add to it a theme, such as theme underscore gray, or three theme underscore bw. Here, I have chosen to plot the graph for G3 using the line draw theme as shown in the bottom right corner. Uh, so note the visual changes in the scatter plot, which you can hopefully compare with the simple G3 variable. And feel free to also see how do the themes theme underscore BW and theme underscore gray change the, how the graph ends up looking too. So if you do want more themes, you can just search ggplot themes online. Uh, you can also feel free to stick with the default theme. Much of this is really just preference. Also, there may be some arguments for certain themes depending on what sort of plot you're making and what you want to highlight or emphasize in your plots. So before we move on to some other plots, let's just do a quick recap now of what we have looked so far when focusing on using ggplot to make some basic scatter plots of real data. So first, we took a close look at the MPG datasets, which is just one of many datasets that are available in base R and the tidyverse package. So this MPG dataset focuses on data for cars specifically. We then look at how to plot a scatter plot using ggplot, and which in turn uses data from the MPG datasets. We also looked at how to choose the X and Y variables, and as well as how to consider the impact of a third variable by adding a color variable to the, pro to the plot, which effectively results in a very compact way of showing three variables while staying in two dimensions. Finally, we looked at some basic but essential visual elements, namely, adding axis and main titles, as well as potentially adding some 
uh, optional themes to the plots. A quick note, I really do suggest getting into the habit of immediately giving proper axis and main titles after you've made a plot. For a little bit of extra effort, you can provide an immense amount of value for anyone reading your good graph, including yourself, as that way they will know immediately what is being like what is being shown and plotted on the graph. So now that we have covered the basics of using ggplot to plot real data, we can then move on to some more advanced techniques. The first technique we will look at involves lines of best fits. What we will focus on here is known as basic linear regression, i.e. finding the straight line of best fits, which assumes an approximately linear relationship between the variables, hence the name. It must be noted that this assumption is core and is very important for linear regression. If the data does not seem approximately linear, then other methods should be used. We will not go through these other methods here. This is just a note to say that you should be very careful when applying linear regression and to always make sure to check that the assumptions for linear regression, namely that the data seems approximately linear, are fulfilled. Later on, you may learn about other assumptions that are necessary too. As always, be careful and remember these assumptions. We will again focus on plotting HWY against DISPL. We're looking at lines of best fit here, as we did in the previous section for when looking at ggplots or well, basic ggplots for real data. So to plot a line of best fits, it is very much advised to also plot the scatter plot first, as this serves as a good way to compare how well the line fits to the data. So if you don't quite recall or understand the method to plot a scatter plot, feel free to rewind to the previous slides in the previous section. So once we have made the scatter plot and stored it in the variable G, we can make a line of best fits. To achieve this, we need to add the geom underscore smooth function to the variable G, which stores the plots that we have created, namely the scatter plots. Let us now see what happens when we simply add geom underscore smooth to G without making any alterations. So as you can hopefully see on the bottom right, the line created is not straight, but is instead a smooth curve. So do note the words in red at this time. This tells us that the method being used here is LOESS. So note that this is not the method for creating a straight line of best fits, as you can clearly see. For that, we want the method LM, namely the least squares method. So before moving on to the next slide, do not clear the environment, but feel free to clear the console. Again, do not clear the environment. We will want to be continuing to use some of these variables in the next slides. Now, to plot a line of best fit with a straight line, we need to specify the method we are going to use in the geom underscore smooth function here. As I have noted previously, we will want to use the LM or least squares method. This method ends up giving us the straight line of best fits that we desire. We also specify for there to be no standard error displayed for now 
with the command se equal false. Note that this ends up getting rid of the dark shaded region around the graph, as you can indeed see in the bottom right corner of this slide. Note though that the standard error is actually quite important. For now, we're just disregarding it and focusing on interpreting the line. Again, to reiterate, in general, later on you will learn what the standard error means. And in that case, you will realize that it is indeed quite important and in general shouldn't just be disregarded so freely. We're just focusing on interpreting the line for now. So before we do move on to the next slide, uh, do not clear the environment as again, we will be continuing to use these variables. So now we do add on appropriate access titles and a good main title with the labs function, which should become a standard practice, hopefully, after going through the, this presentation. If you feel a bit uncertain about how exactly to use the lab function to add these labels, do feel free to rewind back to the point where I have discussed how to add these labels. I myself have also decided to add a theme to the graph. This part is optional and feel free to use any theme that you yourself want to use. So the end results should look like what is obtained in the bottom right. Hopefully you can now see how I can easily add extra commands to the various graphs I have created with ggplot by simply adding these new functions in a similar manner as I would add some numbers together. So now that we have created the graph, we now move on to interpreting the line of best fit, which is just as important as knowing how to make these graphs. First, we check to make sure that it makes sense to create a line, namely a straight line of best fit, by checking if the data points look somewhat linear, in a sense. And you can see that for the most part, the data points sort of do form a rather straight line on this slide. I know that this is very imprecise, but for the time being, this will suffice. So later on, when you're learning about linear regression, you should be presented with a list of checks that you should at the very least check before conducting a linear reduction a regression. And so now to interpret the line. The line has negative slope since it is pointing downwards. This suggests a negative correlation between engine size and highway miles per gallon, which if you hopefully recall from the previous slides is a measure of efficiency. In words, this effectively suggests that as engine size increases, highway miles per gallon decreases, indicating a decrease in efficiency. So a rather tentative takeaway from this basic analysis could be that smaller engines are likely to be more efficient. So before we do move on, let us now do a quick recap of what we have covered so far. We have examined adding the geom underscore smooth function to a ggplot scatter plot that we have already created to create an appropriate straight line of best fit. So depending on what we tell geom smooth to do, or even just not telling it to do anything, the line of best fits will end up looking differently. For example, if we set it equal to LOESS, then the resulting curve will look like a smooth curve. If we do set it to LM, then we will be using the least squares method 
which will give us the desired straight line. Do note that there do exist more methods. Don't worry about them for the time being. So once we have obtained a straight line of best fits, we then need to interpret it. In general, a negative slope suggests a negative correlation and a positive slope suggests a positive one. A slope that is almost flat in the end suggests there does not exist any correlation. Always, also, always remember to check that the data is approximately linear on the scatter plot. So now that we have gone through lines of best fits, we can move on to the second type of plots that we will be looking at, namely bar plots. Lines, which we have previously looked at, are great when comparing two continuous variables. Bar plots, also called the bar chart or bar graphs, are more useful when we are looking at categorical data. This is basically just data that can be organized into different discrete categories, such as gender or animal species, hence the name categorical. There are many different types of bar plots that ggplot can produce, and we will see a few examples of a few types. So for this section, the data sets we will be using again comes from the tidyverse package. This here is the diamonds data set. Again, we can use the glimpse function from tidyverse to take a quick peek at the data set, as well as ask, as well as using the help function to ask R for more details about the data sets. Such details can be found in the bottom right corner, as you can hopefully see on your screen. Again, I do recommend going through the detailed helps in, and focus more on what each particular column actually needs. This will be very helpful in the upcoming sections, so you will know what each variable is short for, in essence. So now hopefully you remember from the previous section that any ggplot plot needs two pieces of information, namely a data frame of data as one and the aesthetic values as the other. And remember, recall that the aesthetic values or AES specify what is being plotted on which coordinates. For now, we only want to look at how many diamonds of each cut type are present. So it suffices to tell R to plot the cuts on the X axis. The Y axis will then display the counts for each category by default. Once we have that, we can simply add the geom underscore bar function to ggplot and we will then have obtained our requisite bar plot. Do note that the x-axis shows the cut type and the y-axis counts how many of each cut type there are in the bottom right corner as expected, which is a good thing. Now, note that we have plotted the cut type on the x-axis. What happens if we had specified AES y is equal to cut? What happens then? Try it out. So after that, doing that, and before moving on to the next slide, do not clear the environment. Again, we want the variable G to be used in the next slide. So in the previous slide, we looked at the counts for each cut type. Now, suppose that we wanted to take a closer look at the proportions instead, namely, what percentage of diamonds are each cut? To achieve this, 
we can do the same thing as we did in the previous slide. But this time we specify in the AES section that the y-axis should represent proportions with stat prop instead of a simple count and also add on group equal one. Both of these are necessary to create a graph of proportions, so do not forget either of them. Now note that the y-axis takes on values between zero and one, which indicates that we are now indeed considering proportions. If you have also tried changing x equal cut in the AES in the last slide, now try doing that idea again and telling AES to assign stat prop to the x-axis along with the group equal one part as well as y equal cut. So see what happens this time. Once you have done that, and again, do not clear the environment before moving to the next slide. Repeat, do not clear. Now, as we should always do, we add on appropriate labels and a title for the plots. Note that the theme change again is optional. Feel free to either stick with the default or use another theme you like if you wish. I'm mostly just showing you some examples of what different themes look like at this point. We now move on to actually interpreting the bar plots. We find that there exist significant proportion differences for cuts since the height of the bar plots vary significantly. The number of diamonds with a fair cut forms the smallest proportion, while the number of diamonds with an ideal cut form the largest proportion. As you can hopefully see from this slide, bar plots therefore offer a quick and simple way for comparing proportions or counts with a categorical variable. Now try making your own bar plots. This time, we want to count how many diamonds of each color there are and compare them visually. In other words, the categorical variable we are considering this time is simply the color of the diamonds. So for this exercise, make the x-axis displayed diamond color and the y-axis displayed a number of diamonds for each color, i.e. the count. Remember to add the requisite axis labels and a title. I recommend pausing the video for now so you can try to complete this exercise on your own. Welcome back. If you did attempt the exercise and finished it, Hopefully your code looks somewhat similar and you obtain a similar graph to the bar plot shown on this slide on the bottom right corner. And which in this case includes the appropriate axis labels and title. As always, feel free to pause the video here and check your own attempt against the solution shown over here on this slide. And again, Anything you choose is fine, or you could even just go with the default. It doesn't really matter. Now we move on to interpreting the bar plots again. So as you can see on the bar plots, there is again a significant difference in the number of diamonds for each color. The color type corresponding to J has the fewest diamonds, while the color type corresponding to G has the most. So besides the basic bar plot of counts or proportions, ggplot also allows us 
the plot stacked bar plots. They are effectively bar plots stacked on top of each other, hence the name. And they again allow us to effectively add another variable to a two dimensional bar plot, which is again very convenient for our purposes. So, for example, suppose so you want to find out what proportion of diamonds of various cuts have a particular clarity. To do to achieve this, we will do what we did for the basic bar plot of counts. Except this time we also specify fill equal clarity in the AES section for ggplot. As always, remember to add appropriate axis labels and an appropriate title. Here, I am also introducing the scale underscore fill underscore discrete function. Adding this function while specifying name equal clarity allows us to control the title of the legend. Indeed, note that the legend title is now clarity as desired. As you can hopefully see on the graph now, the graph also shows how many, how each cut type can be subdivided into clarity type and shows the proportion of each clarity type for each cut type. Well, this does show the differences in some sense. There is a better way of highlighting these differences in proportions in the next slide. So in terms of the bar plot for the previous slides, uh, it's you most likely have noticed that it can be very hard to compare the clarity across each cut. After, also, some data may be hidden if the bars are not sufficiently high enough to display the perhaps very small slivers that may exist. For example, when examining the diamonds that have a fair cut, we cannot see clarity F proportions in the previous slides. To address this, we can stretch each bar in essence to the top and measure by proportion instead of the total number of counts. This indeed will allow us to much more easily see the differences and compare clarity among cuts. So to actually achieve this, we can simply use the exact same code as we did in the previous slide. Except this time, notice that we also add the extra command position equal fill and place that command inside the geom underscore bar position. What this does is, well, it will make the y-axis show proportions and stretches each bar to the top. In essence, it basically fills the graph up from the bottom to the top. So this particular method of stacking bar plots will make it much easier to see how exactly clarity among cuts is distributed and also to see what proportion of each uh, clarity type is present within each particular cut type. So as you can hopefully see now in the bottom right corner, we can now compare between cuts to see what proportion of diamonds have a particular clarity for each particular cut. For example, we find that diamonds with a fair cut, have the highest proportion of clarity type I1. In this case, this is considered the worst clarity. If you want, if you perhaps do not recall what each clarity is means, feel free to uh, use the help function again to 
uh, gain more insight with respect to the, uh, I guess, diamonds data sets. We then also see that diamonds with an ideal cut have the highest proportion of clarity type IF. This is considered the best clarity. So as you can hopefully see now, this method is good when comparing proportions of the clarity type between each cut. However, do note that it does leave out the counts for each bar. So we cannot actually really compare between the absolute values in a sense. We will show another way of presenting this data in the next slide that also shows counts. So in this case, we will then, to resolve the issue in the previous slide, we will simply display the count for each clarity type of each diamond for each cut type. That's a bit of a mouthful, basically. For each particular fixed cut, for example, say the fair cut, we will simply sub the, basically subdivide the bar plot, or at least the bar for the fair cut into its various clarities. And in the previous slide, we stacked them on top of each other. In this slide, we will stack them side by side. So to actually achieve this in the plot, note that instead of position equal fill, we use position equal dodge in the geom underscore bar function, i.e. and well, hopefully you can see that on the slide presented on this screen right here. We then add that new geom underscore bar function to ggplot, and this will end up resulting in the bar plot showing the count for each particular clarity type. And this will then be contained within each particular cut type uh, side by side. As always, remember to add appropriate labels and a title. And also recall that the scale fill underscore fill underscore discrete function allows us to change the legend title, such as in this case, where much like in the previous slides, we changed the legend title to clarity. So as you can hopefully see, this method makes it easier to compare absolute differences visually, while also potentially not leaving out slivers or particular counts that might be particularly low. For example, we can see that the ideal cut also possesses the most amount of clarity IF in an absolute sense, and that the counts for the IF, in fact, are mostly contained within the ideal cuts. However, it is also potentially easy for this sort of that, like this method of plotting a bar graph to be rather messy, especially if you have a lot of variables and a lot of categories. And even here, for example, the data can often look a little bit too squished. And well, if you have, let's say, 15 different types of uh, cuts and let's say 20 different types of clarity, then the bar plot, then the side-by-side -side bar plot will end up looking very squished and it might be difficult to uh, actually figure out the absolute differences and compare them that easily. So in general, each of these various methods of plotting stacked bar plots have their pros and cons, and which one you end up choosing often depends on the situation at hand.
So before we do a full wrap up of all the concepts that we have covered in this particular uh, presentation, I'll first review what we have gone through with bar plots in R. So the main function for creating bar plots with ggplot is simply the bar underscore geom function. So note that this is core for making bar plots with ggplots, much like how in there are other functions which are core for making other types of plots in ggplots. So we looked at different ways of making bar plots, starting with regular bar plots of counts, then moving on to bar plots with proportions. In both of these cases, we only looked at the counts for one particular variable. We then looked at the counts for two variables, effectively adding on a new extra variable with fill. Much like in the case of scatter plots, fill basically allows us to have three dimensions in essence on a 2D plot, i.e. we can basically look at three variables on a 2D plot. In this case, we have the variable on the x-axis, which is the main category in a sense. The y-axis displays counts or proportions, and the fill then is basically a sub, is basically a new category that subdivides the main category. So to achieve this effect of fill, i.e. of plotting three variables on a two-dimensional plot, we looked at stacked bar plots, the basic stacked bar plots. And then we also looked at stacked bar plots with proportions. And then finally, we looked at side-by-side -side bar plots. So as noted in the previous slides, each of these plots have their advantages and disadvantages. For example, stacked bar plots with proportions allow us to easily see the, like very easily see the difference in proportions for this, I guess, secondary category in each primary category, but it also does not account for absolute values which means that some data can be hidden. Again, whether or not this is okay or not depends on the situation and what exactly you want to show. So as you can hopefully see from this, these few slides, bar plots can be a very powerful tool when simply comparing counts or proportions for categorical variables. They are also fairly easy to make and interpret compared to most other plots, such as the lines of best fit that we have looked at previously, but they can still contain a surprising amount of information, which makes them like a very useful tool in uh, general data analysis, and also something to always just keep in mind that you can do. Now, without further ado, I'll do a rather brief review of what we have covered in our lesson. We first started with the basics of R, namely going through the basic objects. For example, we looked at numbers, strings, various functions and sequences, and ended with the help function. Numbers, in particular, are just the numbers you are familiar with. Strings are basically a, a collection of various symbols, whether they be the various alphabetic letters that you are so familiar with, or numbers, or even special symbols like, uh, I guess, various punctuation, or even the addition or subtraction operators. And these symbols are then stored between quotation marks to form a string. 
vectors are informally an ordered list of a collection of these two objects, numbers, and strings in a certain sense. We also took a brief look at creating sequences in R. And these various sequences, they behave rather similarly to vectors and can thereby be created using the SEQ function. We also looked at operations that we could perform on uh, various numbers and vectors. Uh, for example, we looked at addition and multiplication as well as uh, yes. well, multiplication of vectors and multiplication of numbers. We also learned how to create data frames from a collection of vectors. And of course, knowing how to create these data frames are vitally important, as you have hopefully seen uh, throughout our use of ggplot. Finally, we covered the help function. And what that function does is provide documentation for various functions and data sets, as well as other potential objects in R. And again, hopefully throughout this presentation, you can see the usefulness of knowing this help function. For after all, we, I did recommend you use it for quite a few situations. Hopefully it was helpful and hopefully you will continue to find use for the help function. So after this, we then installed the tidyverse package and got into the real meat of this uh, particular lesson, namely learning how to use the ggplot function stored inside the tidyverse to create various uh, plots, which we can have a significant amount of control over in terms of their final results as again, you have hopefully, hopefully seen throughout this uh, lesson. First, we focused on using ggplot to plot basic functions and also learned about the vital importance of using data frames to store our data when using ggplots. For example, creating a vector of x variables, then a new vector of y variables, and then storing both of these vectors inside a new data frame. Again, I guess I cannot emphasize this enough. The usage of data frames is very important. We also learned how about how to control what is showed on the X and Y axis in the resulting plot created by ggplot. As hopefully you saw throughout that particular section. So after learning to make basic plots using ggplot, we then looked at making basic scatter plots using ggplot. And in this case, we also decided to use real data from the MPG dataset stored in the tidyverse. This particular dataset, as you hopefully recall, was focused on data for cars. As so, do note that the data in MPG is stored conveniently in a data frame. This tends to be the case for most, I guess, often, often used or frequently used data sets that are stored in R or Tidyverse or even just accessed online. And of course, that's because data frames are very convenient to use in R. So in this section, besides learning how to create scatter plots based on real data, we also discussed some elementary but vital visual elements, i.e. we learned about adding appropriate axes titles along with an appropriate main title. And hopefully you have learned how to do these, to add these visual elements 
very easily and have developed a habit of adding them after creating each and every graph. We also covered how to add extra colors to a 2D graph to display an extra variable without adding an extra dimension to the 2D graph by specifying what the color variable is in ggplot. This is very convenient for our purposes as it is often much easier to interpret and also show a 2D graph compared to a three-dimensional one. After this, we covered the creation of uh, various lines of best fits, namely by adding geom underscore line function to a ggplot scatter plot that we have already created. I okay. So to reiterate, we created a line of best fits, imposed and basically added that line to a scatter plot. We found that there were actually many ways of creating such a line of best fits, such as the default LOES or LOESS method, which produces a curve of best fits, as well as the LM method, which stands for least squares and produces the desired straight line of best fits in this particular case. We also spent a bit of time on interpreting the line of best fit while comparing it to the scatter plot. I.e., we looked at whether the scatter plot is approximately linear as well as the slope of the line. Recall that a negative slope implies negative correlation, positive slope, positive correlation, and uh, basically zero slope no correlation. We then finally moved on to the various methods of creating bar plots in ggplot. And this time we used the diamond data set, which is also comes from the Tidyverse. We learned about creating and interpreting basic bar plots of counts, as well as basic bar plots of proportions. So both of these methods are simple and certainly have their uses, but they are also a bit limited as they only really look at one variable in a sense. To find the relationship between perhaps two variables using a bar plot, we then added on an extra fill variable which again creates an extra variable in a sense without needing to add an extra dimension to the two dimensional graph, which as noted previously is very convenient. We concluded that section by looking at the three methods of adding on such an extra fill dimension, namely with stacked bar plots stacking bar plots by proportion, i.e. remember we stretched out the bar plots in that case, and looked at the proportions of the fill variable, and then we also looked at side-by-side -side bar plots, where the fill variable is then also subdivides the main variable, but this time the subdivisions are placed side-by-side, -side, hence the name. Uh, final note, so as you can hopefully see by the organization on this slide, both the creation and the interpretation of graphs are very important. You cannot and should not simply learn how to just do one, and both should be learned in tandem. Hopefully each time you create a graph, then you start to also develop the habit of thinking about how to interpret that particular graph and about what the conclusions or like possible conclusions you can 
a draw from your uh, analysis, from like say a basic analysis of the graph. So hopefully you now have a good understanding of the basics of R and as well as using ggplot for basic data visualization to create scatter plots, lines of best fit, and bar plots. Feel free to revisit this video if you feel that anything remains unclear. So here are some references that I frequently visited when we were creating this video. I do want to give a very big thanks to these resources for helping me put this presentation together. I could not have done this without these resources and they have been very helpful indeed for me. Well, thanks for listening to my presentation. I hope you learned something about data visualization and well, hopefully you can perhaps think a little bit more about creating data visualizations and interpreting various graphs. And I, that will be all for today. Again, thank you for listening.